Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Behind the Veil, a show that provides insight into the world of people and events and weddings, too. I'm your host, Keith Willard. Welcome back to the show. Today is a big, special, fabulous day for us here at Behind the Veil because we've got one of our favorite people. First of all, one of our favorite people that I have recently had the, the pleasure of getting to know, um, Tom Chelnick, from the, who is the North American Director of Vendor Engagement for The Knot Worldwide. And if you don't know who The Knot is, you've either been living under a rock or new to the industry, but either way, we're going to make sure that Tom talks about it a little bit before we get deep into this discussion. But before I bring him on, let me bring on my co-host, Marcy Gutenberg, with An Affair to Remember by Marcy. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Keith. So excited. I'm so excited. I am yeah. just, you know, this is something that we have been striving for for a very long time. A very and long time. So to finally be able to get finally, them on yes. the show. And they just said yes. Exciting. You know, the thing, sad thing is that we all we had to do is we just never <laughs> asked. <laughs> Shame on us. I'm like, what is happening here? Anyway, exactly. so I know. So, I mean, all we had to do was ask and then. Boom, and it was happened. But um, let's bring on our guest, Tom, uh, before we like get too far into it. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Keith and Marcy, thank you so much for having me. All you uh, needed to do was ask. That's I know. Do. That's the sad thing, is that yes. all we needed to do was ask. And it was like, no big deal. And you're like, of course we'll be on. What are you talking about? Of course. And that seems super apropos because you guys just put out your real wedding survey, which we're going to talk about a little bit uh in a little bit. But first, before we even get started, for those people that don't know what the knot is, what the what Wedding Pro is, can you give us a little bit of what that, those two pieces are and how you fit into all of that? Absolutely. So let's let's talk about the knot worldwide, right? So the knot worldwide is a global family of brands that really enables our communities to celebrate the moments that make us, you know, weddings and events. At the core of the knot worldwide's business uh, business is is leading global wedding marketplace, connecting with local wedding professionals. Um, our couples love our tools, the wedding websites, the planning tools, the invitations, register services. Um, and obviously they love going into the, in, into the marketplace. So at the nine mm. worldwide, some really cool facts I always wanted to share is we see over 2.3 million couples sign up on our sites every year to help turn their visions into the reality. And the pros that are helping our couples turn those vision into the reality. There's over 9,000, nearly 9,000 users per day that sign up. Um, we have leading wedding planning apps out there too, both on Apple and Android. Yeah. That reach over 4,000 downloads today. Like if you have just today, yeah, four thousand dollars a day, four thousand downloads a day. <sighs> yep, wow. just crazy. It, like check it out and see how all those cool things. The couples couples are using, and there's a statistic out there that 78% of couples are using those using that app to plan their entire wedding. So, um, it's just crazy. It is. And crazy. The, other, the other thing is, 21 million monthly unique visitors per month on our platforms. 6.5 million social followers across Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, Pinterest, YouTube. And of course, reviews, right? Yeah, like reviews. Most reviews there are on the Not Wedding Wire, and there's 10 million vendor reviews on the Not Wedding Wire. So, I know both of you have reviews. Yes, of course. You know, it's one of the things that, as as pros in this industry, it is our one of our basic tools in order to be able to use it in a in a way. Because how else are you supposed to get your name out there? You know, it's like there's not when you're first brand new into this. There's very limited, or at least you think there are some very limited choices, but we'll talk about all that. But I really want to talk about like you, your past, where you came from, because what I find really fascinating about you is that you were with the knot, but then left and then actually was with a venue and then came back to the knot. And I love the fact that you have a different perspective right. than somebody that's never been on that side. Can you talk yeah, a little I'm, bit about that? I'm the boomeranger. They call I know. me the it's great. when you come back. So I started at the Knot 2008, 2009. I was there for 12, 13 years. Many different roles there. I was uh, regional sales, director of training and enablement, but I traveled 70% of the year um, learning from wedding pros across the country and then taking that information back to the Knot, helping other wedding pros be successful. Yeah. Um, then when we merged, the Knot and Wedding Wire merged a few years ago, um, I helped merge the sales and training and enablement team for a few years. 
Then I got tapped on the shoulder to become the CEO of two wedding venues in St. Augustine, Florida, Lux wedding venues, high-end wedding venues, and loved the owners and helped them from the beginning of their business. Probably on one of these trips, I met them. And I thought, no, I have a good job. Why would I want to? <laughs> like I, I'm comfortable. I'm at the top of the brand, you know? And right. I thought, well, you, you know, I got too complacent and I joined them as a COO. And I really wanted to know what it's like to w- walk in wedding pro shoes. Um, and I did that for two years and learned a lot. And it was a distance from my family. So after two years, I came back. And now I'm director of vendor engagement. And I'm back to doing what I used to do. I right. travel the country 50 to 70% of the year, meeting with wedding pros, hopefully learning from what learning from wedding pros and hoping it hoping to teach them something. So well, that's one of the things that I actually found super impressive with you at the very beginning is that you asked questions. You didn't just assume because you have talked to a million people, it seems like. But you you were already always interested in people's stories, where they came from, what they were doing, what was working for them, how they were presenting themselves. You know, all of those pieces and parts, like you were filing it away. You could almost tell, like a little Rolodex. Okay, yep. One, let me add one more to my perspective. It's it's a unique ability. Not yeah. everybody has it. Uh, well, no, it was- I want to write a book. Like all the all the wedding pros that you meet, like all you wedding pros in the, my little stint for two years of dealing with couples, imagine the book we can write. But right. I can write a book on wedding pros, you know, like the good, the bad, and the the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Which I, I and that. you know, that's all of us say that. You know, we all say that. We, we all can write it. a book. We all can write a book. And yet, yeah, nobody right. has yet. So maybe that's something maybe. out there for somebody watching us. <laughs> for, for sure. So. Um, but let's get into this like real wedding survey because it's so funny because it it raised a little bit of hoopla here in South Florida because obviously the big statistic, the big headline was that, you know, an average cost of a wedding was 32000 or $34,000 for an average cost of a wedding in what most people thought Florida, but really it's Southeast, South, Southeast. So it covers multiple states, but people went, what? You can't put on a wedding for $34,000. And and we, if you look at the entire report, you can see that it's broken down. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about where that number came from. Where did that that thirty four thousand or thirty two thousand came from? Uh, absolutely. So if we back up a minute. Let's talk about the real wedding study in general, right? So the right. not does the largest study in the world, and we surveyed nearly ten thousand couples uh, married in twenty twenty three. In a typical year, we're conducting researches. Uh, research for more than 300,000 couples and guests. So we take all that information and we slice and dice it and put it into a way to help our wedding pros make decisions in their business or at least know what's what's happening. Not only just statistics numbers, but also engage uh, trends and things couples are doing in certain areas and not doing in certain other areas. I always like to say real wedding study, take that, take those numbers and what's in it for me as a wedding pro? What's in it for me as a wedding pro is how can I improve my business? What should I change based on this information? Right. So when you're seeing the number of thirty-four, thirty-five thousand dollars in South Florida, oh, that's that's you know that is an average, right? So I live in South Florida, but I am on the northern end of South Florida, and to get married here is a lot less expensive to get married in Miami, where you where you guys are from. So it right. literally is an average, and we're very clear with our couples. We're saying this is an average. We're very clear with our pros. This is an average. We cannot break it down to the point of, you know, county or city. um, Well, and I was actually going to ask that. Is there a possibility of that at at some point in the future to have it broken down by county or city? Or is the data collection not to that point yet as far as like per county, per city? It it is. When 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 we send out the survey, they'll say where they got married and where they're from. So if they're getting married in, in Miami... It, it constitutes a South Florida market. Uh, if they're saying they're getting married in Vero Beach, which is two hours from Miami, it constitutes a South Florida market. But also, how many couples are responding in Vero Beach compared to Miami? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's right. it would be not a big enough pull, pull to break it down by city. Some cities like Manhattan, absolutely. I mean, we, right. it's a very specific market. It's Manhattan. But something like South Florida or, you know, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha is like, I believe, one huge state of a market. So, it is, well, yeah, I mean, you really can't 
<laughs> realistically, we can't break it down by city. But but again, please, everybody, it is an average. Don't freak out. It is an average. Because trust me, some people in, in the middle of the country would love their average to be $35,000 because it's $18,000. Right. You know what I mean? I so know. Well, and you know, and when I looked, when I actually dove into those numbers a little bit, one of the things that I took away from it is that the South Southeast has the higher per person, the highest per person rate in the country. I think we're equal to one other, but the lowest guest count. So we are paying more per person for less, but less people, which I thought was really, really interesting. So, you know, it, it means that our, our people down here, our weddings are much more focused on the guest experience piece than, than having the big, large, over the top, you know, Correct. 200 and plus wedding. Am I correct in that? hundred percent, but that varies by market too. Um, I was talking to a venue in Wisconsin and their average guest count uh, at their venues, like 140. Well, we know that in South Florida, the average guest count, I think is around 96, right? Like, and, and it varies. The, um, I just pulled up an interesting stat. The number um, most expensive place to get married in is New York, Manhattan, the outer boroughs, right? Like their average ceremony and venue spend is $63,000. Whoa. So, but then we go down, Whoa. we go down to Miami, which is around the 15th and the average is around 35, $39,000. So it just varies across the average guest count in, in Long Island is 122. The average guest count in Miami is 96. So, you know, we have statistics by market, reach out to us, you know, reach out to me. My, my email should be in here. Um, and I'll send you the statistic by market. So and it goes to, through things like average household income, average age, most popular right. and Gary engaged in number of guests. So, well, so and the, get, is that sorry? You first, Mercy. Okay. No, they you've, get into the methodology, meaning like a DIY person versus a budget person versus maybe somebody who's more traditional or luxury. Um, for the various components. It's no, it's, we don't have that. It's just lumped all into one. Like we take all those statistics and lump it into one, you know, like we do like in some markets, um, religious institutions are still people are getting married in religious institutions. Others aren't some markets like in Los Angeles, for instance, historic building and homes are the top ceremony venue, you know, compared to barns in Texas and Miami. <laughs> Right, Farm Barn I mean, and Ranch. Believe it or not, all those beautiful venues down there in Miami, and there's still the top is farm barns and ranches. So I can't break it down into Marcy into like the DIY couple versus the all you know high end. So one of the other big statistics that people came up with, with that people were talking about was the number average of vendors was 14 for a wedding. And of course, I looked at that and went 14 vendors. Who hires 14 vendors? And of course, again, if you look go through the statistics and start reading it. It included your uh, wedding rings, not your engagement rings, your wedding rings, your menswear and your wedding dress, which are things that I would have not normally not thought of as a wedding vendor, but I guess they are. They are. I mean, they have a category that does very well on the non-way wire. So um, they are, they are a wedding, they are a wedding vendor. So, and that, that number changes not drastically throughout, throughout the country, um, it ranges anywhere from 12 to 15 vendors, depending on right. the market. Um, but it's on average, it's about on average, it's about 14. So I always look at that. Okay, what's in it for me, right? Like, so right. If I know that you know in my market there's a lot of um, video people are hiring videographers, and I'm a photographer or I'm a planner or whatever it may be. Should I get in the videography business? Like, how can I capture some more of that some more of that revenue, right? So you know. They, they reached out to Marcy, they reached out to Keith and you're going to do your primary service, but what else can I help you with? Especially in the, in the, in these economic times, you got to get as much revenue coming in as you could possibly get in and think out of the, and think out of the box. Well, and I think, I think that's the biggest part about everything that, that the real wedding study was about is about how to maximize your, your availability to get to people based on these numbers, you know, Base, base your advertising, your marketing, and all your other pieces based on, on these numbers. Like one of the one of the most fascinating pieces about this survey was the difference between Gen Z and millennials. Like oh, yes. the percentages, like 
planning with <laughs> you know within six months 20 percent of gen z 15 percent of millennials ask friends and family for referrals 75 percent for gen z and 71 percent for millennials that is a huge number i mean referrals is like holy moly that's a big piece Big. And that's, you know, and but that's an intangible. That's one of those things that you do a good job and then people refer you. And then Pinterest, which I personally cannot stand using Pinterest. 72% and 67% respective, uh, respectively, Gen Z and millennials. Why Pinterest? Why is Pin? I mean, do you have any any insight into like okay. why so this is such I, a big I, thing? I do, I do a little bit with this Pinterest thing, but it's interesting. <clears throat> For years and years and years, couples have described their wedding as fun. Fun is the was the main descriptor. Fun, fun, fun. I I want a fun wedding. Right. This is the first year that that's changed. Fun is still up there, but it's no longer number one. It's romantic. So. <laughs> They and think through Gen Z, right? This Gen Z group, they're they're coming into the marrying age here. Soon they're going to be your your more more of your clients and millennials for sure. Right. Um, but they grew up in a unfortunately in situations where there was a lot of divorce, a lot of instability, and they're taking their time of who they're going to get married to. They've had the all these tools at their fingertips to plan this wedding for a million years, and they're relying on soft things like Pinterest to plan this romantic wedding. So on the knot, it's really cool. Uh, they sh a couple has the ability to build basically their own Pinterest board, like their right. wedding vision board. And I was helping somebody today and I said, listen, you got to go in and here, look at this Pinterest board and reply. And, and three out of five, they were all these romantic photos. The script was romantic. I'm like, right on, like our real wedding study is right. You know? <laughs> yeah, they still want fun, yes. But, but back, like, what's in it for me as a wedding pro? We right. know that romance is a big descriptor now. Let's get some romantic pictures up. Let's share, you know, romantic ideas to for their wedding. You know, help them in, help them make their vision come to come real. So when when it came to the challenges that couples are facing, I love that you know, obviously we all know, especially in South Florida, the big B word, which is. You know, a lot of people try to shy away from the big B word, but that was the number one challenge, planning within a budget. But right. then if you read further into it, almost half, close to half, went above their budget, ended up spending more money than they in originally anticipated. Right. I always, I, mean, look, I always look at that budget question as they don't know. You know, right? I had I, yeah. my daughter's wedding seven years ago. I had no... And I'm in the wedding business. I work for the knot, like the director of the knots kids getting married. You know, you, there's a show that you need to put on, right? Like my daughter was young and I was dadzilla. Like I was dadzilla during my daughter's wedding. And I, <laughs> but I doubled the budget because I just didn't know. Right. right. So um, one big takeaway from the wedding study, Keith, you hit upon is economy is playing a much bigger factor um, this year than any other year before. Yes, right. you have a budget and a large percentage of them do, will go over the budget with right. the wedding pros that are willing to help put their vision together, right? Like I, you know, you have to partner with these, these couples, they will spend more money, especially Gen Z. If you show value, you build trust, you build rapport, you're being helpful. All of a sudden they will prioritize your business over other ones because you're helping them. Stress is another big takeaway. Um, everybody's stressed in today's world period. Right. But then yes. on top of, on top of planning a wedding, partner with your couples, help take some stress off of them, give them tools, be helpful, paint the picture for them, take the time with them. And they'll be willing to give you more of that budget that they have. But the economy played a, as a big factor. I think you hit the nail on the head, still having weddings, the right. budgets are still good budgets. They're not hiring as many people. They're not bringing in as many people because it's about, like you said at the beginning, guest experience. I would right. rather spend more money on the food and the alcohol and the dancers that are coming in or whatever guest experience that you professionals can put together for these couples. That's what they're willing to spend money on. But does that also mean, because the old way of thinking was, here are my office hours, 8 to 4. I've got office hours from 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. And I, we've listened to several experts in the field that are very well regarded talk about the fact that you have to have boundaries, that you have to have moments, and you know, don't get into texting. And yet, I find that's where my couples need 
need more and more. More of them are needing evening, early evening weddings or, or appointments, or, you know, I'm having to make hours on Saturday because they are working so hard. I mean, they are so diligent about working and saving money, which is counterintuitive to everything that we've been hearing about millennials for so long. The Gen Z's are like, save, 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 save. Well, they are, right? hundred percent, hundred percent. And, 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 to your point, your flexibility of hours of when you can talk to them, right? You need to be flexible. Yes. The people that are in this business, now I'm going to get all passionate here, right? Yes. So, and you, we've been in this business a long time. We've seen generational changes. The wedding pros in any business, we're talking about wedding pros that have stayed in this business, but the next generation that coming is coming, they had to make adjustments, product right. adjusted, services adjusted, marketing, advertising, where, um, how you're responding to leads, you know, packages. If you can't make adjustments based on this, you're you're going to die. You're going to be in the forget it, you know. Um, and it's just it's just the way it is. It's not a bad thing. Remember when the millennials first came out? The world yes. was empty. Yes. What was that name? When it comes to millennials, you know what I mean? Now everybody, oh, we miss the millennials. Well, well, I don't, I don't really miss the millennials. I mean, I, think, I seriously, yeah. I, I love the fact that I like the fact that I am able to like have early evening and weekend stuff because that's uh, honestly, that's where my, I'm, my availability is already is there in that. Cause usually during the day I'm making, I'm typing emails. That's, I mean, literally the whole day is just working on logistics and talking to other vendors. And then, you know, and plus my husband works really stupid hours. So really long hours. So I, it, it fills up my time. I'm like, all right, from four to seven, I'll, I'll take on, anybody that has a real life and has to work for a living and is only able to meet with me in early evening. And it's amazing how much people appreciate it. It's crazy. Right. And I think that some of the old thinking, this survey helps us kind of go, okay, let, let me open my eyes and think about what I need to do. Because again, at the end of the day, it's about putting food on the, on the table. It's about right. paying your rent. It's about, you know, and, and this survey, I think if dug deep into enough, does a lot of that for you? Does that some of that thinking for you? So it's interesting. Another fact, because we're talking about stats here, 91% of wedding planning happens online. That's not a surprise. But couples surveyed spent an average of seven hours a week of planning. Seven, seven hours. hours. And I'm thinking it's, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. But like seven hours of focusing on one thing, I can't eat. I mean, that to me is that is is, is a lot. Right. So now the goal is right. We got to there. They found you online somewhere. They reached out to you. Now you need to hook them. Right. So you need right. to be available when they're available. You need to build trust or rapport and, and help paint that help paint that vision. Seven in 10 couples reported they had at least one vendor who helped calm their stress down. And that's the vendor that they chose. Right. Oh, so see, like, what are we doing as wedding professionals to help our couples? Even psychotherapy to them. What can you give them in leads or in your website or in your blogs and things like that? Let's talk about that and connecting with these couples a little more to help grow your business um, and book more weddings, I should say. So, Marcy. Oh, yeah. did you have something? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, the, well, and on that line, you know, when we talk about the blogs, so going into that that direction, I feel sometimes I feel a little like burned out from all the stuff that I have to do on social media online in order to make sure that I'm always constantly in front of couples. You know, it's about putting the right photos. I mean, we were talking right before we went online. It's like, you got to have a wide variety of photos that show not only your $250 million weddings or million dollar weddings, but also your $70,000 weddings and your $50,000 weddings, because you want to be seen as a, as approachable and affordable to everybody. And then, and then the second piece of that is just the, the social media, like having to post on Instagram and the wedding wire and the not and Facebook and Pinterest oy, and Pinterest. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. It is I a mean, lot. how how do you get to a point where you're creating unique, unique stuff that people actually want to pay attention to? And is there a future at some point that, you know, where we post on the knot and then it goes to our Facebook and our Instagram account? Because I would love that. Well, that I mean, is good. Hey, you know, we got the connections. We can ask. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to be able to do everything in one place for a, a wedding vendor would be in Incredible. Right. I mean, I know that there's tools out there already, software, but yes. I mean, if I'm already yeah. using the knot, it would be incredible to be able to do that. Just one, little one thing that, yes. that, that 
a lot of wedding pros, they don't know who their ideal client is. And I, I say this at least twice a week where I say you have a, an identity crisis because I look at, I look at Instagram and I see one type of client. I look at your website and I see another type of client. And then even within your website, I see three different types of clients. Now I know you're throwing a big net out there to try to grab everybody, right. but if you throw a big enough net out there, you're going to catch something and you're going to, and you're going to be hungry and you're going to want to eat that fish, right? Because you're hungry, you got bills to pay. But when right. you start fishing with a pole, right? And you're fishing with a pole with the right bait, you're connecting to that client and those are the clients that you want. So, you know, is, are you an option on the not wedding wire? That's where, where couples are going. Are, you know, how are you, how are you showing yourself there? How are you showing yourself on Instagram? All these, all these things add up to catching the right fish with, with the right bait. But um, I get it. We're in, Hey, couples are having an economic tough time. So are we, we all are. Right. So like narrow it down as much as you possibly can fish with the right bait. These tools like the real wedding study, you know, they're, you know, planning online. You got to make sure you're being online. You know, 70 some percent of them are using the apps. Are you on the app or aren't you on the app? All those right. tools add up to getting well, that fight. Well, and I know that there's some new tools coming out and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I did want to ask you specifically about uh, one of the statistics that was in the, the wedding surveys, um, survey that two fifths are looking for underrepresented groups. And I wanted to ask you the question is, does that also mean that two fifths of the couples are also underrepresented? So in other words, you know, does that wash itself out? Like if I, as a gay couple, I would look for gay vendors or LGBTQ plus vendors or LGBTQ plus positive vendors. So, you know, am I seeing basically the same ratio of underrepresented couples to compared to underrepresented vendors? Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I, it makes sense. I would say yes, but I don't want to say yes um, for sure on that. Right. You know, um, it's I mean, because the, the hope is, is that, society at large is becoming much more open. Oh, and, yeah, and, yeah, you know. Imagine 10, 12 years ago, you know, there was, oh. you know, when, when people started putting in the little search criteria of LGBT, you know what I mean? Like that was, that was, that was a big deal. So, you know, love is love. You know, we certainly go through above and beyond making sure that we give options to all of our couples and, right. and, and let our wedding pros, you know, get themselves out there for, to the underserved groups too, as themselves. So please, I still remember still Magnolias, their name it, it <laughs> hired three gay people and their name is Mark, Mike, and Steve. Supposedly <laughs> they're all named that. <laughs> and I remember being so excited, not that my name is Mark, you know, Mike or Steve, but they actually said it on TV, you know, on a big movie. And I went, Oh my God, there's me. Oh, I'm one of those people. I have track lighting. I have track lighting. So hey, thank, thank goodness we live in the world in which we live today. Right. I mean, it, you know, what people I mean? do, people do go, Oh, what, what kind of world are we live in? I'm like, ah, I guarantee you it's not, we've, we've gotten better. You may not be able to see it over time, but we've gotten better, which leads me to my, my other piece here. I love the stats to compare the previous generation to this generation, because it makes me really understand the difference in thinking, because we have to change our thinking in some of these things. Do you, is it possible to get the stats based on not just the last two generations, but like maybe the last four generations? So we could see, or however long you've been, uh, you know, create, uh, getting data to see how the changes have happened, not just over two generations, but three generations or four generations, because there are, there are planners out there that have started, that started planning three generations ago or four generations ago that don't always understand what this means now based yeah, on that. Are. You I know, mean, they, they think uh, millennials, oh, you know, millennials. But. I mean, we, we have, we have stats pretty far back. I only can see from like two to two, right now from 2016 on, and there's not a, as far as trends are concerned, if that's what you're talking about, specific trends, you right. know, think things like there's Gen Z isn't going to have as many people in their wedding parties. It's just the way it is. Gen right. Z isn't going to have everybody dressed in the same colors. That's, it's just the way it is. They're also not going to, you guys have been seeing this more than I have, even with millennials, the garter toss and the bouquet toss and all those, all of those things. Have, have go, are going down. The big, the big change 
is this idea of guest experience in the past three to five years. And that just keeps coming, it's getting bigger and bigger. I think that's part of being the social media that there's so many of these really cool weddings out there and they're seeing Cirque du Soleil dancers coming off the, the ceilings. I want that, you know what I mean? Like, and then they realize it's maybe a little bit out of their budget, but to see three to four change generations, that would be interesting. I mean, right. Where we have it. <laughs> I mean, that would, I mean, I would love to see something like that, that says, look, yeah, exactly. change your perspective because the world is changing all, is yeah. around you. That's that that generational sense. shift. If you're not realizing it and you didn't change, what was before millennials? Probably me when I am, right? I think I'm a millennial. No. Gen X. Gen X? No. Gen X to yeah, Gen X. Gen X to me. millennials. If you didn't make that generational shift, you would have been out of business or been struggling. You've made that shift somewhat. Might have taken you a few years, but right. you made it within it. Now the same thing, same thing with same thing with Gen Z. So when it comes to the future of technology and seeing how this is changing, because you said, you know, 91% went used online services in order to plan their wedding. Yep. Is there a is there a time that there's a a program that replaces a planner? You know, you type in your wedding date and you go to the knot and the knot goes beep, 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 based on this, you know, yeah. and you hit book. Never, it's never, never. I think the cool thing, especially with planners, it's actually up 7%. Uh, uh, Thank you, hotels. I'm going to add that to the hotels because the hotels are starting to make part of it. But I'll take planners. that, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. We would never in a million years have some sort of online planning classes or you know think thing, things like that to replace our replace our wedding pros you guys are the experts we are simply the conduit to you and do we give tips and tricks and editorial and things like that yes but we're very very clear and concise saying each wedding is unique each budget is unique each vendor is unique you need to fi find these things out on your own so 100% like we're just the conduits well, one of the trends that I really was interested in, and you brought this up a couple of uh, months, actually, when we were at the Wedding Pro Experience event, is- um, Which the, was amazing. The, which was amazing, oh, by the way. The next one- It was one of the best conferences I've ever been to, to be honest. Ever. And it was only 20, it was what, 48 hours? It was incredible. It was the next incredible. one's in Austin in September. Uh, oh, I'm from Texas. Oh, I'm so there. Um, but the, the idea that- um, that we've we've gone to a whole different way of thinking about when it's when it comes to alcohol, right? Because Gen Z thinks about alcohol in a totally different way than millennials do, because they're all about healthy bodies, healthy lives, and they see one drink being as unhealthy for you versus millennials, and of course our generations go further up. We're you know welcome to Mad Men, but you know. The, the fact that 62% only had only 62% had an open bar kind of threw me because I thought it would that would be a higher thing because you know typically people are like oh you don't have an open bar you make us do a cash bar um you know how are you seeing that trend you know happening because I, you brought up like mocktails but I want you to dive a little bit more into that sure so so part of guest experience is the alcohol, the mocktails, wh whatever it may be. So when you're seeing a stat out of a venue in Texas, that same situation, they this couple didn't want alcohol or they just wanted wine and beer or something. So they created a juice bar menu and they created th th these healthy juice drinks, like smoothies and stuff. And it was a, it's a fancy place, you know? So the people that are serving venues and bar services and things like that, they're coming up with options, right? Like, and as time goes by and millennials get older and there's more millennials or more, you know, less likely to have full bars, which I still think there's plenty of people going to be having a full bar out there, you know, in, in, in <laughs> plus, you know, if I show up at your wedding, I'm going to take 20 bucks out of the car if I have to actually pay for my booze <laughs> or I'm going to sneak my booze in. Um, you have to adjust, you have to adjust to that, right? Like the mocktail situation, hundred percent, but like, how are you serving? How are you giving it to your guests? Are you having the, the ice that, you know, the dry ice in it or and, right. It's that whole experience situation. So interesting stat, because I picked up on that too, Keith. Um, so, I mean, when you- It just seemed lower. That's all. I mean- It, just, it does seem lower. But it does again, seem that's lower, an yeah. opportunity. If we think that, that we believe that's going to be happening, I don't think this is a big thing at this point, but if it's happening, how are we going to adjust our products and services to that need? You know, and maybe yeah, you just are throwing it out on your website that you have it here, you know, and that- 
probably that gets somebody to think, wow, okay, well, that's, you know, cool. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call that venue, that bar service or that caterer or whatever it may be. But so, um, quick change question from the audience. Uh, if, if you're new to the knot and have never advertised on the knot before, which is better the knot or wedding wire? Well, it's interesting. Um, there's only like, a maybe I should have read that before. <laughs> uh, I, I've heard that before. Um, oh, you have? Okay. Uh, there's only a 1% crossover, less than 1% crossover of couples from the knot to wedding wire. It's two separate audiences, right? So the knot, the knot couple, um, the person that goes on there, they're more looking at inspiration and editorial and things like that. And we have that on the wedding wire side too, but it's much heavier on, on the knot side. Um, so which one is better? They're, if you're not on both, you're not an option to one or the other. So right. it's two separate types of couples. And I can't even say one spending more and one spending less situation or DIY. I look at it as like the tolerance of planning. Some people just don't love to plan their weddings and they're going on and they just went down and dirty. I want to look at the directory. I'm going to find my videographer, my planner, and my calligrapher and all that stuff over here. The other ones maybe on the not side. Yes, I want to find all those things, but I also want the editorial content and everything else that comes along with that. Why is it, so a bit more is, inspirational? A little yeah, more so, inspirational, Marcy. Thank you. Yeah, great words. Great. So words. the knot is more inspirational and wedding wire is a little bit more le like straightforward planning kind of. Yeah, kind I of mean, there's inspiration, 100% inspiration and there's tools in there and ev everything else, but it's two separate couples, you know? And what I was that? I have firsthand knowledge of that because we did, the venues I was working at, we did 330 weddings a year. We got 9,000 leads a year. Right. Wow. So it was a rarity and we advertised on both. It was a rarity that you would ever have the same person email a, a lead on, on, on both sites. It was just such a rarity. It's just crazy because the, the two being separate companies and then coming together was kind of a moment of like, wow, they really have cornered the market doing this because you used to have used to felt feel very like two separate companies. And so now it's like it is confusing as somebody I could see why it would be confusing for somebody coming into it new going, well, why do I need to, to advertise them both? Because they're owned by the same company, but you've really? kept them separate. We made it easier for you that we're now owned by the same company. You can advertise on both. And the tools that we give for <laughs> all your leads come into one inbox and they're not separated. And, but you still have to build two storefronts and, you know, put different photos up and everything like that. And um, I think it's actually a good thing, right? Because because they're two separate types of couples or two right. people, we capture then, you know, close to 100% of the market. Um, what do you want people to get out of the the wedding planning survey? What what kind of like what should what's your hope that vendors with this information do? I my hope is, and I've we've given this presentation lots of times, that you walk away, and I think there's a QR code too. Are you putting a QR code in there? Um, that you walk away with this information and you look, how do I need to do I need to adjust my budget? Am I on, on my budget? My my product services, all of those things based on what I'm hearing. Can I add any products or services? For instance, um, what's the stat? There are people, uh, photographers are being hired more than ever before to shoot proposals. Right. Right. Venues yes. are being hired more than ever before to, to have proposals at and same with, with planners. So that statistic could help you maybe come up with a new service for your business, right? Even videographers. So there's all those types of nuggets in there that there's additional revenue streams in there that will help grow your business and serve, serve, your, serve your clients more. So that's always my biggest hope with this. Um, and there's a change coming, you know? And are you, yes. are you prepared for that change? So, oh, you go ahead, Marcy. No, I was going to say, I mean, it's a perfect opportunity for somebody who is maybe a planner who would get in on the ground floor, so to speak, during the engagements part to get up to their wedding. I yep. mean, they've already built that relationship. Yep. So the next obvious point would be the wedding. That that There's one quarter proposal, say they hired a photographer or additional vendors to do their proposal. That's more than doubled since 2019. So think of that opportunity, right? There's plenty of planners out there that are offering proposal services. Um, I know I know tons of them, but I don't see a ton of photographers or videographers or 
even venues, these beautiful venues that sit empty on a Friday morning or a Thursday night or looking over the mountain. You know what I mean? Like pick up a couple hundred bucks and do a proposal, proposal thing. So that's, that's always my biggest thing. It's not meant to scare anybody. It is meant to help. We put a lot of time, money, and effort into these real wedding studies. Yeah. And we put it out there for our professionals to, to take advantage of and, and make this good decisions about their business. So I was just listening. I just went to an event where by MPI and they had um, some like incredible uh, president of a, a hotel chain to, talking about, you know, COVID, what it did to us, where we're at, how we are. And he said that they recovered all of their money within a year and a half from COVID, which I found really fascinating. And the problem that they're having is they can't find enough people in order to provide the service because their their yeah. hotels went from zero to 100 and, and in a year and a half. He goes, and not, not just 100, but 160 because we already recovered all the money that we lost during COVID. So now we have more people but we have less people to serve them and that it's just turned into a major issue that it is almost uh, continues to self cycle because people get burned out quicker, which means they leave their jobs sooner, which means that they still have that issue of keeping people hired. Are you seeing that in just in the wedding industry in general, or is that kind of isolated into the venue or the hotel side? I, I believe your question is, are, are wedding pros having trouble hiring? Exactly. Are wedding pros having uh, trouble hiring? 110%. I, I hear it continuously, you know, that, and it's every category, right? Photographer, some of my photographers, they can't find second shooters and or third shooters. They can't, you know, venues, they can't find pe people to, you know, clean doors, open doors and, and things like that. Um, it's the world in which we live, right? So when you have somebody, treat them well. Make them want to be your bet. You be their best friends and 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 hold on to them. But abs absolutely, that's a problem across across the world. And it's interesting too because you know I look at the job market. There's a lot of jobs out there, but there's a lot of people looking for jobs. But in the hospitality field, you know, uh, it becomes even more important to partner with your local college. The venues I ran were up in St. Augustine, Florida, Flagler College, and they had a hospitality program. We partnered right. with that hospitality program. We taught classes there. We brought them into the venue. They shadowed weddings, right? So we were feeding our business through these college graduates. You know, during college, they were working weddings, you know, et cetera. So it doesn't matter what category that you're in. Reach out to your local colleges and see what hospitality classes they have that you as a as a hospitality professional and that's what we're all in regardless we're in the wedding business but we're all um see if you can partner with them and, and find some people that way and also do good do good in your community help these well, and by the way we have several people from fiu actually watching us right now oh, so cool. uh, yeah so um and by the way i put up the qr code up on screen so that qr code that you're seeing just over here on me is actually the qr code for the we real wedding survey so and there's a lot more a lot more stats in there a lot, a lot, a lot more stats. Yeah. What? So I'm going to go to the FIU people. Um, if somebody wants to get in, you know, because they do have a school of hospitality and they're interested in getting into this world, obviously start with this kind of study. But can they reach out directly to you for additional information or even a possibility of coming and speaking to the the college? Always, please. always. Yep. Please. In the day I used to speak at like in Houston and Dallas and Indian River State College here, um, but it couldn't just be me. You know, we'll we'll we have we have a plethora of people that, you know, we want to part. We have to send out and speak and help. But I'm all about helping. That is I'm a. a and I will say that it's, it's just one of the tools that I did not use over the last couple of years over since I started actually with the knot. I never had a review of my storefront, not once from anybody until this last event. And I mean, why? I have no idea because it's a free tool. You guys do it as part of just being with a knot, it seemed like, because everybody was super, super helpful about it. All is, you that, need to do is, ask. is that one of the tools? Is it just ask? All you need to do is that. And we have account managers out there that will be calling on our pros and things like that. And um, all you need to do is ask. We are more than willing to help you improve your storefronts um, and give you the tips and tricks, like upload your pricing on your storefront. You know, <laughs> no, you notice, you notice I didn't even get into that, Harry Ball, so. right? On your storefront, you know, 
you know, 1988 called and they want their photos back that are still sitting on your storefront, you know, like, Oh my God. That's so uh, true. But people, you know, people are busy. Pros are busy. I get it. You know, I've been right. there and you know, you're a one man or two woman or whatever show and you're doing everything. Um, but none of your marketing advertising should ever just be set it and forget it. You right. know, you don't, you're not doing that right. with your Instagram. You're not doing that with all those other things, but you know, and you get out of it, what you put into it. So, so What's the future of the knot? Because you there, there were a few things that you talked about at the conference that were like very exciting. And I don't know if you can really talk about that now, now or if that's a wait and see kind of moment, but because there's some some exciting things yeah, that are coming. Absolutely. I think we do so much that's good, right? Like sometimes all you hear is the bad, but we do right. so much, so much that's good out there. And the the near future as we're going to do a better job at sending wedding pros, here's an email. And this is how many people liked this photo. This is how many people clicked on your website. This is how, you know, more statistics to show you the engagement that's happening on your storefront um, and, 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 and narrowing that down a bit. We're going to be, you know, right now you have this great dashboard and you can respond to leads and you can see some analytics. We're going to break those analytics down, down a little bit more for you. Um, nice. We're all about leads. You know, like right. every lead that you all get, no matter where it's coming from, is a qualified lead because they found you. So yep. they need your product or service. But some people, pros out there, they only want quality leads, you know, or quantity. I like to say quality. A quality right. lead, they, they found your service, but they're also in your price point, they're in your location, the aesthetic is right there. But the reality of it, those qualified leads that you're getting from any source that you're getting, treat them like gold and follow the process because you can turn every day a qualified lead who might not, might not think they can afford you into a booking for yourself. So those are the things we're working on. You know, like, um, we, of course, we want to send you all perfect leads, you know, but they're all qualified and narrowing down and putting pricing on your storefronts and just reading our tips and tricks are going to help you. So right. efforts for our wedding pros this year and into next year, big changes. Another question from our FIU people. Are you guys accepting interns? Um, we have interns um, in our offices, like in New York and um, some other place. Oh no. Yes, we are accepting interns because we're remote. So yes. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, it's marketing oh, interns. It's computer interns. Is it specifically to hospitality? I don't know, but you should always be looking on our website and looking for opportunities there. Perfect. And again, guys, this is the QR code over here. If you want to get to the real weddings survey and um, I, that's our time. Oh my God. Is that time? It went, I know. Oh, it my went, it, it, oh my God. It flew by. It's like crazy. It's so <laughs> crazy. So Tom, I want to thank, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and talking a little bit more about what the knot does and the real wedding survey. And I think that this has been a, an enjoyable, but Oh, eye opening conversation because yeah, you know, I think there's a couple of people out there going, maybe I need to read more. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. That, that's the goal. Like read, but then take action, right? Like right. I want to, and we as a company, we want to hear from wedding pros when things are going good, and we want to hear with wedding pros when things aren't going so good. Let us try to help you. We are the biggest brand out there in weddings. We have the biggest audience that there is. We have the most wedding pros out there. Um Look at these statistics. If you have questions, reach out. Honestly, we're just here to help. We need we need great vendors, wedding pros to serve our great couples. Yeah, so. and I know we're, we, we're going to have to have you come back on because we didn't even talk about the reviews. We didn't even talk about putting your pricing on your storefront. I mean, there was so much still yeah. out there that I feel like we need to have a second Let's, part of this yeah. at some point. Will you come back? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Awesome. I'm honored. I, I can't believe I'm actually on here because... From afar, like I've known about this podcast for a long time. I just never thought, oh, well, maybe why, why would they want little me? Are so, you kidding? Yeah. Oh my God, we're so excited. <laughs> and actually in two weeks, we're going to have Esther from, um, that is your editor from The Knot Worldwide, both in print and online on the show to talk about yeah. how to get published on The Knot, yeah. which is incredible. I'm so excited about that. But of course, are you kidding? This yeah. is like the kind of information that us, even, even wedding we couples out there, would would eat this up because they want to know what other couples are doing. Honestly, they're like, are we crazy that we're thinking this way? And the answer is no, because you're basically 
doing exactly what everybody else is thinking. It's like exactly like the seven hours a week planning. I'm sure that there there's some couples listening to us right now that are relieved by are relieved by that because they're like, man, we really thought we were you know putting way too much time into it, but you're not. This this is what we do. You know, it's one day. Statistically, Monday mornings is when the planning starts. When they get to work, they start planning their wedding. <laughs> That's always been the statistic. Of the Monday week. morning is, the, is the big day, huh? Monday's a big day for planning their wedding because they played all weekend. I better start planning my wedding again while I'm working. So <laughs> it's true. That. That's true. <laughs> Tom, thank you so, so, you so, so much. much for being on the show. Keith and Marcy, thank you. I, I love the friendship. I love the banter. Please, anybody out there, if you have questions, reach out. We are more than willing to help. Thank you again. And again, we'll be back in next week um, with Behind the Veil. But in two weeks, tune back in because we're going to have their deputy editor of The Knot Worldwide. It's going to be on here to tell you how to get published on The Knot because that's one of the things that helps you get in front of couples is getting published. But for now, we're all going to say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you.